decree. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Church, let's worship. Oh, worship the King. to be seated. Let us come together in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord and God, we thank you for this day and for each day that you grant us. You are sovereign over all of creation, Lord God, and we thank you for your deep and abiding love for us. And Father, while we were once a rebellious people who were turned to our own ways and leaning in to the desires of our flesh, Lord, you rescued us. Heavenly Father, you sent down your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He redeemed us through his shed blood on the cross, and we are made your sons and daughters. 
Father, you had no reason to love us such that we deserved it. Instead, Lord, you chose to love us. Out of your great and abundant love, you poured grace out to us, and Father, we thank you. We come in these moments, Father, and we, we exalt you, and we seek that this gift that you poured out to us would not be something that we simply keep inside of our own lives, but that each day you would give us the words, that you would teach us the actions and the ways that we might go out into the world and share it with a lost and hurting world around us. Father, as we come together this day, we pray for our brothers and sisters out in the world. We pray for those who don't know you, who have leaned into other things of this world, who have trusted in other things, Lord. We pray over their lives. We pray that they would come to know you through our witness and the witness of other brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we pray for those who know you in a shallow way. For those who know your name, who claim to believe, but their lives are still, still lived by their own strength and their own power. Each day they struggle. They face a hopelessness. They face battles and they wonder why you aren't in it with them. Lord, we pray that you would guide them into deeper devotion, into a deeper level of trust that they may know you more and that they may know the strength and the power that you give them to live each day. Lord, we pray for all of us who know you well. We pray, Lord, that pride would not overcome us, that we would not trust in our own faith. But Lord, we would trust in you and you alone and know that the faith that we have is faith that you have given us. You have provided us the capacity to have faith, Lord, on our own we would, turn toward you, we would turn toward ourselves. We would turn from you. So, Father, we thank you. Almighty God, in your word, again and again, we see the witness of your people crying out to you for the struggles and the pain and the trials in their own lives. They call to you for rest and for rescue. They call to you for peace. And for healing. Father, we echo their voices today as we seek that in our own lives. Lord, not only ours, for you say that the prayers of the faithful bring forth a great yield. And you encourage us to pray for one another, to pray for the believer and the unbeliever, to pray for the friend and pray for the stranger, to pray for those whom we love and those who we struggle with. Lord, you call us to be in prayer for all, to call upon you and your mighty works. And so we've come here this morning, Lord, and there, there are people and there are situations and circumstances that are on our hearts and on our minds this day. And we just want to spend these next few moments, Lord, naming them out, sharing them with you. Gracious God, hear our prayers and grant peace and wholeness, grant help and healing. Let each one know your love, your commitment, and your mighty grace. And Father, now would we unite in one voice as we speak the words that your Son, our Savior, first taught. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A body of Christ, dear people of Holly Calvary, we are blessed to be called into partnership with the Lord our God, to spread his word throughout this community and beyond. And so let us come offering our tithes and our offerings, offering the very works of our lives with all the gifts that he has placed in us. Let us give generously unto God this day. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege of being a part of your kingdom work. Lord, we pray that you would receive these gifts and the very gifts of our lives, Lord. Put them all to work for your kingdom work that many may come to know you as Savior, as Father, as Almighty God, that we would be known as your beloved, your children. We pray ever in your name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Do you believe that God created you for a purpose? It sounded like a pretty good yes. I like that. I could try it again and say, do you believe God created you for a purpose? Yes. Do you believe that Christ saved you for a purpose? Yes. Do you live according to that purpose? Yes. That sounded a little less certain. You know what, I, I can relate to that. I, I have really wrestled with the message this week, part of it, because, and some of you know, I, I went through a very difficult week. Um, 
a lot of challenges going on internally around some things. I'm not going to go into the deep details of it, but I went through a week that made me question a lot of things about the things that I'm committed to and the things that I'm doing. Made me wrestle internally. And there were points where I wanted to throw in the towel and just say, I'm done with this thing or that thing. Can you relate? Yeah. I mean, we just like, I'm done. How do we stay on track? How do we stay on track on, uh, in the times when we sit there and we're going through parts of life or, or certain elements of life and we just kind of want to go out to the brick wall and hit our head into it again and again and again and say, why do I keep getting up every day and doing this over and over again? Sometimes we go through it like that. We were just like, we can't believe we're this dumb to keep on going in the same pathway and, and, and getting frustrated like this. Other times we get into the mindset of saying, you know what, nobody appreciates what's going on. Nobody's listening to, to, to what is being spoken. So my voice is just being like shouted at the drywall so it's not making an impact. Why should I keep pouring myself into that task, into that duty? Why should I do it? And it comes back to one thing in my life. And it's really interesting that this was the sermon this week. It's almost like God knew I was going to go through this issue, these challenges this week. And then he's like, oh, I want you to preach about this. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I'm going through one of those difficult times about this very issue. And, and you want, like, give me three weeks of perspective so I can look back and do this well. Do you hear what just happened there? Give me three weeks of perspective so I, I can look back and I can do this so that I can live according to whose purpose? No, 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 no. When I'm in control and I want to be able to talk from my power and strength, I'm doing it because I want my purpose to be clear according to me. I'm not leaning into God. I wanted to change the message. I wanted, or I wanted to sidestep and not talk anything about what's going on in my life. I, I, I just want to like, okay, how do you live according to that purpose? And I think when we're pressed into those times, when we have the times we want to throw in the wall, or throw in the towel, and when we have the times when we feel like we're speaking and nothing is changing, and this has nothing to do with you. This is beyond the churches where all this is happening right now. And, and we just, we, we battle, but what keeps us on the track? And I believe it is the divine calling of God, that God has a purpose for our lives. And as much as we, we get to wavering out in the world, as much as we want to, you know, drive our head into the wall and say, why do I keep on doing this? We wake up the next day and it is God's purpose that we lean back into as we open up the word, as we lean into prayer and God sets us back on our feet and, set, and says, okay, let's go again. And if you would have told me on Tuesday that everything was going to be where it ended up by Saturday, I would have looked at you and said, you are out of your mind. There is no way that it can go from here to here in these four days because this is so messed up right now. I just can't see this ever happening, let alone in four days. And yet, it did. Go God, right? I mean, I just kind of want to go to God at the end of those days and say, I am so sorry for my unbelief. And that's what I do. I have had that happen in so many circumstances in my life where I have prayed a prayer. I had one a few months ago here, and it was about something in my family. I prayed a prayer, and I'll open up about it. Um, my relationship with my oldest son, Eric, had become distant. We were struggling in it. And I walked this sanctuary in the morning and I prayed and I'm like, God, this is breaking and ripping my heart open. How can I keep on talking about the, the, the restoration that you do in relationships where I'm, when I'm experiencing it being pulled apart here? And that night, God prodded me to call him. And in my head, I thought, this probably won't work. And I called him, and he was pretty busy, but he gave me a couple minutes. And I, I, I really just said, I can't go back. We can't go fix what was, but I'd like to build something from here forward. And the next day he called, and we talked for an hour and a half. And we've been connected ever since. And we've got a family night every Friday night at our house, and most of the time, he's there. I watched God restore what I had doubts about. 
All I could see was the brokenness. But when we put it before God in prayer, God God answers. One of the things God has purposed us to is to lean into him, not into our own thinking thoughts and ways. So when God has a purpose for your life, you get up every day and you lean into God. And no matter what happened yesterday, no matter how discouraged you were, no matter how strugglesome it was, no matter how much you wanted to quit, no matter how much you were living in doubt, thinking that anything could ever change, you wake up the next day, you lean into God, and God has a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand ways of saying, with me, anything is possible. His purpose lives in us. And every day he invites us to seek it and to rediscover it. Maybe you're here and you say, I'm not exactly sure what God's purpose or God's vision is in my life. I believe there there is a purpose, but what has he put me here for? Or maybe you're in a place where saying, you know, at one time in my life, I knew what my purpose was, but I completed that. Or I've gotten older and I can't do that thing anymore. Or I've got... Our purposes shift, don't they? And sometimes that that makes us feel obsolete. Or or maybe our talents and abilities shift. And we say, well, since I can't do that anymore, can I do anything? And, And God's like, yeah, my vision with you is not done. God is one who has a a habit of calling people at times when maybe it's not what we would consider logical in their life, like when God called Abraham and Sarah when they were in their 90s to birth a new nation, a people who would be called the people of God, a people who would long after God. To the counter of it where we look at a young boy named Joseph at the age of 17 who was sold by his siblings into slavery and became a servant or a slave in Egypt. What on earth could God do with him? He was so young, and he was in a foreign land, but he was given a vision that there was going to be a great famine that would come. And he needed to provide for the people in Egypt. He was elevated to the second highest position in the kingdom And he preserved all of the citizens of Egypt with all of the preparation that he did in storing up grain. And who showed up on his doorstep? His brothers. Looking for some help. A a 17-year-old who wasn't too young to be used by God. To Moses, who was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter and then called to lead his people out from under slavery by the Pharaoh. Had every excuse in the book. These people aren't going to accept me. They don't believe me that, they're, that, that I'm really part of them. I don't speak very well. I don't. He had every excuse that there could be. But when he finally surrendered to God's purpose in his life, all of God's people were led out of Egypt through the Red Sea and toward the Promised Land. How does Moses, as they get on the other side and as they begin journeying across the the open desert toward the promised land and the people are sitting there and making comments like, why'd you do this to us? You just brought us here to die. We're going to die of thirst. Gives them water. God provided, right? Oh, now we're going to die of hunger. Why couldn't you have just left us in Egypt? How does Moses keep on track with his purpose when every day the complaining of thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands are just on him? They're like, we need to elect a new leader. You're the wrong person for us. You're the, right? I mean, we experience these kinds of things in life where God is called and yet, you know, we're living out God's purpose and things aren't magically just falling into place where the people are like, yes, Moses, we'll go. We have full faith and trust. We know that, no, you have to do it in the face of adversity, in the face of challenge, in the face of trial. 
When Moses died, there was a man named Joshua, recognized as a great man of faith under Moses. What commission does God give Joshua? He goes, you're the military commander. Joshua's young. But you're the military commander. I want you to go into the promised land. You know, the one you guys avoided because it was scary before. I want you to lead the people into the promised land. And I want, to take, I want you to go and take down the most fortified city in the world called Jericho. Nobody messed with Jericho. But Joshua did. Had to wake up so many days and wonder, God, are you sure? What does God speak to Joshua? Be strong and courageous. The battle is already won. Now go fight it. I wonder if that would change the way that we live our lives. The way that we live out our vision and purpose that when God calls us to a vision, to a purpose for our lives, that his message to us is the battle, that purpose, that vision. That's already completed. Now go take the actions. Are you with me? I mean, if God is ordained, my wife used to have this thing that she looked at me and she said, you know, you, you believe in something. It's God plus one makes a majority. Are you with me? If God has called you and you listen to God's call and you begin to live out that purpose, does it need any other affirmation? Does it need anybody else behind it? Does it if God plus one makes a majority. Will God provide for it in every way that it needs to be? In the beginning, it does not look like it can be accomplished. But if God's called it, then God has already proclaimed the victory. Just like he did with Joshua. Gideon, another young guy unimportant person. Gideon, when charged with the call that God had purposed his life for, which again was to be a military commander, he said, out of all the Israelites, I'm from the weakest clan, and I'm the weakest person in my family. In other words, I am the last person in all of Israel whom anybody would trust in to lead them. Do you know the story of Gideon? There, were, there was an unbelievable army. And God looked at it and said, Gideon, too big. We need to whittle that down. Looked at it again. It's like, no, nah, still too big. I want you to go into battle with just 300 soldiers. Where you are now about one on, if I remember right, one against 90. 90 enemy soldiers for every one Israelite soldier. These don't sound like good odds, do they? But God said, this is my vision for you, Gideon. You are going to lead the people, and you are going to not only defeat the enemy, you're going to show them my power. You're going to show that the God from heaven is with them. That's why I've chosen you, the weakest one. We can look at David, who took on Goliath. He was dismissed. He wasn't even a soldier. How could he possibly win the victory for God's people and ultimately be appointed the king over all Israel, the greatest king in Israel's history? The king whose the proclamation was made that in his line would come the Savior. And Esther, sweet young Esther, could it be possible that God has appointed you for such a time as this to save your people, to stand up in the face of rules in a kingdom that said if you do the things that she did, she would be executed? But she stood boldly and strongly because that was God's purpose for her life. And then we walk into the New Testament and we see a bunch of guys that, I mean, we're talking about fishermen and tax collectors and nobodies. That Jesus said, I call you because God's got a purpose for your life. And then as we look through the scriptures, we find other places where there's 72, there's 120, there's thousands that are called and purposed according to God's will and plan for their lives. There's even a guy who is persecuting Christians, who wants them all imprisoned or dead, and God says, I want to bring you to know me so that I can send you out to all those people who don't believe in the God we believe in. 
I want to send you to the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul was sent into a land that was hostile already to the idea of Judaism, let alone Christianity. What is God's purpose for your life and for mine? I want to take you to one last person. His name was Nehemiah. In 586, the, the 586 BC, the Babylonians captured Jerusalem, burned the temple, destroyed the city walls and the gates, and the people were taken to Babylon and forced into slavery. After 70 years there, what was left of Jerusalem was in shambles. All the gates were broken down. All the walls were crumbled. All the, it was an absolute shame. And where was Nehemiah? He was in the Babylonian, now the Persian kingdom, because Persia had con conquered Babylon, and he was the cupbearer to the king, which was considered a position of high honor in that kingdom. Because what your job was, as cupbearer to the king, was that you tasted the king's wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned. I don't know that I would call that a high honor. I mean, a high level of trust, yes, but that seemed like you were a disposable person. But that was the position Nehemiah was in, and why was he there? He got a report, and we're going to read that report. He got a report back about the condition of Jerusalem, and it caused Nehemiah to act. So I want to take you to Nehemiah 1, 1 through 3. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The, walls of the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. This is what Nehemiah got as the report back. I mean, Jerusalem, what had happened is when the Persians conquered, they kind of let any Israelites that wanted to go home, go home. And so they did. Only years later, Nehemiah gets this message back that nothing has changed in Jerusalem. The city is still in shambles. Nothing has been restored. And your walls around your city, you hear them talk about that. The walls of the city were kind of the pride of the city. It was what made you a city. If you had walls, you were now defined. That is Jerusalem. If you didn't have, have walls, you were just a hill of rubble. It, you, you were nothing. And so that was part of their identity as a people. What did Nehemiah experience? He heard this story. He heard this story. And then in verse 4, we hear some powerful pieces here. It says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. How many of you have ever had something that has made you sit down and weep? Something that is out in this world that has made you sit down and weep. Maybe it's something going on in your family. Maybe it's something going on out in the world. I read an article last night, and it absolutely devastated me. It said 15 to 31-year-olds, twice as many, lose their life to suicide as to being murdered. I could not believe those statistics. And they are continuing to skyrocket. I heard these things and I sat down and just wept. We look out on what's going on in our world sometimes and it moves us to weeping. We dwell on it. We, we, we're frustrated. We don't know what we can do about it, but it starts with that weeping and then it moves. He started off with weeping, so, so he became aware of it. It says, then I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. What do we do when we're against an impossible obstacle? We, we turn to the Lord our God, right? Nehemiah says, I fasted and I, and I prayed. I sought God. I, I leaned into God with what was troubling my heart. I, I felt a need and I, I bonded to that need. And I prayed over that need. And then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. 
We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Can you imagine how Nehemiah prayed this prayer? How he was, he was grieving and he was mourning and he was fasting and he was praying. And he got before the Lord and he said, Lord, I see the disgrace of Jerusalem. I see the disgrace of my people. And I confess, just as you said, if we confess and turn... And I seek the promise. I seek that you would fulfill the promise that you made to us. <clears throat> Nehemiah was clear about his purpose, his calling. It burdened his heart, and he was going to go before God until God restored Jerusalem. I don't know if Nehemiah knew that he was going to be the one at the helm. But ultimately, God provided, provided him as a leader, and provided all that was needed to restore Jerusalem's walls, to restore the temple, to restore the gates, to make it once again a city and a people. And if you went back to that city, the first thing that you saw was it was impossible to rebuild it in the amount of time they had allotted. And yet they did. They did the impossible because Nehemiah accepted the purpose that God had for his life. And believed that God plus one indeed does make a majority. And didn't let anything get in his way. Were there, were, were there obstacles? Yes. There were enemies that were sending distractions and threats and ways to get him to stop doing what he was doing. There was a little bit of internal chaos going on. There was complaining. There was, and yet Nehemiah, again, in the midst of all of this, turned back to God and then said, I know my purpose and I'm going to live in that purpose. I'm going to live in that place. I'm going to walk every day according to that and let that be my guide. When you have something that your heart is burdened with, when there is a need that God lays upon you as a burden, and when you begin to mourn, when you begin to grieve, when you begin to weep, and when you begin to pray to God and say, God, how can this be transformed and what part of it do I have? Don't let your situation don't let your station, don't let your circumstance stop you. I don't know how God will do it, but God does. And you may say, I can't do it. My body's not able to, to keep that up. My body's not able to handle that anymore. Okay, so who does God call alongside that you may walk together? If there was something that was demanded of physically, and you said, I physically can't do it, but I'm wholly committed to this, and, and, and I said, you know what? I, I'm going to tag team you with my son Elijah. How many would go? You know what I'm saying? When, when, when God knows exactly what his plan and his purpose is and how to accomplish it in and through us. And I guarantee his greatest purpose in our life is not to come to church and sit for an hour every Sunday. He's got something larger than that, that he has equipped us for, that he has blessed us with the skills, the ability, and the passion for. And that initially is probably going to feel like something that is risky, that others will doubt in, that others might even discourage you about. But if God has purposed your life in that way, if God has called you to that vision, then whose voice will you listen to? When, when do we as a people start saying, God, no matter what the world is saying around me, no matter what the circumstances are, I'm going to lead into you. I'm going to say, God, put me to work. God, equip me with all that I need. God, secure the vision in my mind and my heart such that it will not let go of me and I won't let go of it. Witness to me every day by your spirit. Everybody that I named Everyone in the Bible that I talked about, and so many more, 
had every reason to say, God can't do it through me. I mean, most Christians like Abraham, right? I mean, he's the father of the nations. I mean, he had this great trust. He trusted God to provide a son for him. He trusted God to preserve his son. When God first came to Abraham, his name was Abram, and he was what we call a polytheist, which is what pretty much everybody in the ancient world was. They believed in a whole pantheon of gods. And God said, Abraham, I am the one true God. I want a, I want a covenant with you. I want a relationship with you, a partnership with you. What would your first thought have been when you were called to witness that to others? Who the world's going to believe me? I've been a polytheist all my life. I've been a polytheist for nine decades. Who is going to believe that there is just one God now? Or if you're the Apostle Paul who has been imprisoning and murdering Christians, who's going to believe me when I say Christ is the only way? Who's going to look at me when I say those words and not think, he's just trying to set us up so he can throw us in prison? See, friends, the, the arguments aren't new. The debates are not new. And the challenges aren't new for us. The obstacles are not a new thing. These are things that Christians throughout the ages have faced. And those who lean into God's vision, God's purpose for their life, and say, no matter what, that's where I'm going to attune my ears, my heart, and my mind. I want to take you to a verse. I'm going to throw Josh off a little bit here, but I want to take you to the Romans verse. There's a verse in Romans 12 that, it's an interesting one. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Prior to this, it says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, offer your the whole of who you are to God. And then this thing, don't conform to this world's pattern, this world's thinking, this world's approach, this world's doubts, this world's... Opt don't be conformed by those things. Don't let those things shape, shape your life. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I'm going to give you a little Greek lesson. I know you love my Greek lessons, okay? I'm not even going to teach you a Greek word. I'm going to teach you about the phrasing of be transformed by the renewing of your mind in Greek. It is spoken in a form of Greek or, or a, a, I can't remember what they call this kind of stuff, uh, the, the, the parsing of the verb, the tense of that verb, it, it means to the renewing of your mind this day and tomorrow and the next day. It is the continuous, ongoing renewing of your mind. It's not a once and done. It's the promise that the renewing of our mind, of our thinking, is constantly being done by the Holy Spirit. Which is why when I go to bed at night, wanting to drive my head into a brick wall and wonder why am I going to get up in the morning and do it again, I somehow get up the next morning and that is gone and there is this renewed passion and drive and hunger and I can't wait to get to it. When it's God's vision, he's renewing our mind. The world does a beating on us, we find rest in him and he renews us and we're equipped to go again. Friends, I challenge you, if you know that vision, that purpose in your life, to be like Nehemiah and lean in every day and call upon God to be faithful to what God has promised to you. If he's called you, then he's purposed you and he's promised to equip you and guide you in every step. And if you're here today saying, I don't know my purpose or I knew it and I've lost it or it's changed and I'm not sure what it is today, I want to invite you, I want to challenge you to lean in. Nehemiah didn't know his purpose when he heard what was going on in Jerusalem. All he knew was that it grieved his heart and he leaned into God and then God set his feet in motion. Over and over, that's the testimony in this book. And over and over again, every Christian that's lived since the final chapter of Revelation here has known that story when we live in God's purpose.
Gracious Lord and God, we thank you that you have a purpose for us and that it's not about anything of this world, but it's about your kingdom purpose in this world. Lord, as we look out and we see the pain, the oppression, the struggle, the hopelessness, the darkness, as we see things that grieve us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, move us to the action of prayer. Move us to grieving and mourning and open our ears and our hearts and our minds that we may be attentive to how you are leading and purposing us in this season of our life. Pray in the mighty, the glorious, and the wonderful name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Church, rise up. I love that last verse. Rescue the perishing. Duty demands it. Strength for your labor the Lord will provide. Whatever purpose he has called us to, whatever vision he has set before us, he will provide all the strength that is needed to accomplish it. Let us go out to a lost, a hurting, and a confused world and share with them the love, the grace, and the glory of a mighty Savior. Amen? Amen. 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 Uh, This evening, yes? Okay. This evening we have got a gathering out at the Samuels house. Can we bring up that slide, Josh? Are you able to click on that? Look at that. Rocket him. Um, Six o'clock this evening. We'll be out at their house. It's at 6470 Ormond Road. If you don't know where that is, come and talk to these wonderful folks in the front. If you don't know who I'm pointing to, Alice has got a yellow something or other on her head. (laughs) I don't know what to call it. I'm sorry. Uh, (laughs) But uh, (laughs) anyway, it is a bring your own drinks. Lawn chairs and food to share, some snacks, chips, desserts, salads, whatever. They are providing hot dogs and buns. That's appreciated. It's the bun part. Good. And uh, condiments, paper plates, and paper products will all be, all be provided. So come on out. It is a great time out there. There's not a single mosquito on Wayne's property. 
I'm hoping that's true. Um, <laughs> he's trying really hard on that part. And uh, so praise God for that. And uh, so come on out and enjoy, you know, enjoy that time tonight. Great time to, to connect together as the body of Christ. So right now, we can go down to the other end of the building, down to the Fellowship Hall. We've got some wonderful, whoa, I got one more here. Come on up, Janet. I forgot about this. Well, you got to wave your arms at me. All right, I'll let you sit down for a half sec. Maybe a little longer, that's why I... Okay, can you hear me? Yes. I hope so. Okay, I want to talk to you about a person who was a child, had a heart for other children knowing that someday she would be a teacher. And that person has held many positions as a teacher. She's participated at Holly with VBS, Sunday School, Children's, and the Trustees. And those that know Heather understand her feeling the best she can do is to lead children to know the Lord. So with this, Heather, <laughs> I ask for your support for Heather as the director of their children's ministry. She's excited and so are we. Amen. And now she's living out exactly what I talked about today. And she's praying, but you know what she covets more than anything else? Your prayers. Pray for her, pray for the children. And pray how God might use you as part of that ministry. And don't doubt, you know, we, we will leave Annie on the front lines, so you don't have to worry about getting bowled over. But, uh, you know, we are going to have a good time. There are lots of pieces to this children's ministry to make it successful. And Heather will be sharing with that, sharing, us, sharing that with us in, in the weeks to come. So, praise be to God. Let's go forth in Christ this day.